All right, so we've recast the diffusion equation into the diffusion equation for um, the Fourier transform and the Hankel transform of temperature. And when we did that, we got a much simplified looking diffusion equation. And it turns out that it's simplified enough that you can actually get an analytic solution. So because this is just a second order ordinary differential equation with a minus sign in front, I can just write the solution as a, as a pair of exponentials. One is a negative exponential and the other is a positive exponential um, with respect to the variable z. Um, and of course there's a set of unknown coefficients that would go in front of those general solutions um, that I'll call c1 and c2. Um, so, and you'll note that the the actual exponential term contains a thing called u, um, which is just basically the square root of this thing that had appeared as a prefactor in front of the temperature, um, which is basically a combination of a material property and also the, the uh, transform variables k and omega, the frequency is actually tucked into q. Um, so um, I can write that in terms of a pair of exponentials or, and this was suggested, this is basically the basis for what I'm going to show you, um, I can just think about these two things, the positive exponential and the negative exponential term, as something I'll call b minus and b plus. Um, I'm going to refer to those as a state vector. If I were to know the value of b plus and b minus at any point in the system, or at any point in the layer, so if I knew what value of z I was at, and I gave you b1 and b, b uh, if I gave you b plus and b minus, I would be able to evaluate the temperature. So in some state, in some sense, knowing what the value of b minus and b plus is, is kind of like knowing the state of the system or the temperature. Um, why would I, why on earth would I want to refer to things like that? Well, what I'm going to do um, is basically I'm going to keep track of a vector. I'm going to keep track of b plus and b minus, but I'm going to write it as a vector. And if I know both vector components, then I know the temperature. Um, or similarly, that's equivalent to just separately writing the positive exponential term and the negative exponential term um, there. Okay, why on earth would I want to do this? Well, hang it, hang in there um, for a second. It, it has to do with matrix transformations. Um, basically, in, in summary, what I'm going to end up doing is using a series of matrix transformations to allow me to use information about one point, one state in the system, so one point in the system, to figure out temperatures at other points in the system. Um, and so like one operation might be translation, right? So like I know the value of temperature at one position, I would like to know the temperature at a different position. Maybe I can use a translation um, matrix to basically help me figure out what that is. And that'll turn out to be true. Um, or if I need to go across an interface, um, if I need to know what's going on on the other side of an interface, I can use a matrix transformation to help me figure out the state of the system on the other side of an interface. So if that's totally unclear, that makes sense because I haven't explained it yet. Um, so just hang in there. All right, so um, let's think about what happens if I um, know the state of the system, let's say at the top of a layer. Um, I can write that in two different ways. Um, so let me just pull out my pen here. So if I'm thinking about, let me just make a drawing here. So let's pretend like this is a layer of material and um, this is the top. I'll call that ZT. And this is the bottom, Z bottom, ZB. And they're separated by a distance H. And at least according to Feldman's paper, what we should do is I'm going to the top, the topmost layer corresponds to z zero, so this is actually the increasing direction of z. Okay, so I can either describe the state of the system, so this is my b plus and b minus. Um, I can describe that either by just writing that it's you know c plus times e to exponential to the u times z at the top. Or I could write z top in a different way, right? I could just write z top as the z at the bottom minus h, which was the thickness of the layer. So if I want to know the difference 
Um, if, you know, if I, I can write the state of the system either of these ways, and um, what that tells me, I, I can sort of, you know, pull out the minus h, right? So I have an exponential of u times something in parentheses that involves addition. I can separate the minus h portion from the z portion and rewrite that in terms of a matrix. So what is, so this, this would be this, if I look at what the thing on the outside of the matrix is, this is basically the state at the bottom of the system or the bottom of the layer. This is the state at the top of the layer. And this is a matrix operation that connects the two of them. Um, therefore, basically the thing that I pulled out as a matrix here basically describes a translation matrix that helps you calculate what's happening at the top of the layer in terms of what's happening at the bottom. Um, so it's a translation matrix. And you'll see that basically the two things that are the, on, the, the only two properties that appear in here are UN, which basically involve the thermal properties of the layer and, uh, and the transform variables, and H, which was the thickness of the layer. So this basically de defines how to get from the state of the system at the bottom of the layer to the state of the system at the top of the layer. So that, that is a translation matrix. Okay, and um, I can similarly define another translation matrix that helps me connect what's going on when I interface two materials. Um, so the continuity equation, you know, basically requires that the temperature be continuous when I go across a boundary. So um, by the way, this as a minor point, if you are uh, starting to think about these things already, uh, this algorithm, like what I'm going to show you, does not intrinsically account for Kapitza resistance. Um, you'll see that later when we're done, you can trick it into accounting for Kapitza resistance, um, but it doesn't actually account for Kapitza resistance up front. Um, instead, um, what it does is it, it asks for temperature continuity uh, between interfaces. Um, and, and that means that the state vector um, on the two the two sides of the system, so like for layer n, had better be equal to the state vector, um, you know, on the whatever the bottom side of that interface is. So there, that is the definition of temperature continuity in our system. Similarly, the other condition is that we would require heat flux continuity. So that requires that the heat flux be continuous on the two sides. Um, let's figure out what that means in terms of the state vector b. Um, so, you know, continuity of heat flux means that the negative of thermal conductivity times the temperature gradient needs to be continuous at the interface. So that needs to be the same in layer n as in layer n minus 1 when I evaluate at the interface. Um, of course, uh, what we're doing here is in Hankel and Fourier transform space. So I need to take the Fourier and Hankel transforms of the temperature. All right, so after taking the Fourier and Hankel transforms, it doesn't really do anything to the form um, of the equation, but it's important because um, what we need in order to actually calculate this is to go back and look at our definition of the temperature gradient um, in Fourier Hankel space. So this was our temperature gradient that we got from our analytic solution. Um, if we take the derivative of each one of those terms with respect to z and multiply by the uh, thermal conductivity, um, basically we get a, an analytic expression for how um, the two states on the, you know, on one side of the interface are related to the states on the other side of the interface. Um, so, you know, following the Feldman algorithm, what we'll do is we'll, we'll box these two equations. So these two equations for temperature and heat flux continuity can be combined as a matrix equation or a, something that connects. So the, the top, the topmost row of the equation basically, or the topmost row here connect is basically temperature continuity and the bottom most row defines a heat flux continuity. Um, I'll just note down at the bottom I've written this, but um, in order to write it in this simple way um, using a matrix, a set of matrix equations, you have to define this thing gamma, um, which is the thermal conductivity times U. And remember that U is essentially something that depends on material properties in here. Um, so if I do that, well, 
it, it actually makes more sense to basically move one of the operations to the other side of the equation. So if I take the inverse of this and multiply it times the other side, um, basically what I'll find is that I can define a transformation matrix that is appropriate for an interface. So well, this matrix transformation relates what's going on the next, you know, in the next layer down to what's going on in the next layer up, right? So this is B plus and B minus on a lower layer compared to one that is higher up or closer to the top. And with some transformation matrix in between that basically depends on the material properties themselves. That makes sense. Um, if, you, if you dig far enough into these, you'll see that gamma basically represents like the ratio of effusivities of the two layers, but whatever. Um, you know, from the point of view of the algorithm, this is just some transformation matrix that helps you get from the state of one layer to the next layer. All right, so I need to wrap this up somehow because I now have a set of you know, matrix transformations that can take me from one type of material to another across an interface or up through a layer using translation matrices. But in order to do that, I need to have some starting point for doing this translation procedure. Um, and so it turns out that there's something fortunate that happens in the bottom most layer of a material, which is that, um, you know, in most of these TDTR experiments or even FDTR experiments, the frequencies of modulation are so high that heat doesn't actually penetrate all the way to the bottom of a substrate typically. And that means that um, we actually know something about the behavior of the state of the final layer. Um, so in the final layer or the bottommost layer, layer N, capital N, the way that I've been um, writing it, um, we know that the temperature should not blow up to infinity. Um, but you know, if we look at the um, solution, the analytic solution we had for the temperature profile, one of these terms looks like it blows up to infinity um, if z goes to infinity. Um, so if z gets large. So obviously we don't want that to happen. So for a semi-infinite material, what we would expect is that B plus um, needs to be zero um, for, that, for that material, or at, at least at that position. So for the final layer, um, we expect that B plus is zero and B minus, um, or actually it's C2 that is, uh, C2 has to be zero in the final layer, which means B plus is zero everywhere in the final layer. Um, and B minus, well, I don't actually know what the state of B minus is, but, um, but you'll see that it actually doesn't matter. I can just assume that it's some number. Um, so I'll just for the moment set it equal to one at the top of the layer. So whenever Z is zero, I'm gonna set this thing equal to one. Um, you'll, you'll see why it works. Um, okay, so in the final layer, B plus is zero, and I'll just set B minus to one at the top of the layer. Okay, why does that work? Well, think about my goal. Um, my goal is actually to calculate um, G, which is the point response function, which involves the, um, which involves essentially the temperature at the top of the first layer and the heat flux at the top of the first layer, um, you know, in Hankel and Fourier transform space. Um, I actually now have analytic expressions for what this is, right? So, um, you know, in any layer it would be, so the temperature by definition is B plus plus B minus um, at that position. So I'll call that B1 um, plus plus B1 minus. That is the temperature at the top of the layer, um, the top of the first layer. And what I need to do is evaluate the heat flux at that location too. Um, it turns out to be equal to gamma times B minus minus B plus. If you want to see why, uh, font's a little small here, so you might need to blow things up. But um, if I take the temperature and I actually take the the temperature gradient and evaluate it at z equals zero, um, that is the expression that I'll get. Um, so now why do, and let, let me go back to the point about why I can just set b minus to any number I want. So in this case, one. Um, well, it's basically because whatever I assume about um, b minus, uh, so it says b plus here, let me get a pointer and fix that. This should say, 
minus. Um, whatever I had assumed about that, um, when I start taking these linear transformation matrix, it's just going to make a linear change in the result. And then, so that'll affect the temperature that I calculate and the heat flux that I calculate equally. So when I divide the two of them, whatever I put here, like if I had put in two or three or whatever, whatever it's going to, whatever it is, it would have canceled out anyway. All that matters is that I'm going to end up taking a ratio. And so if I'm thinking about a, a computer program, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start using the state at the bottom of the system, use a series of transformation matrices to get myself to the very top layer, the top of the top layer of the system. I'll calculate this quantity, and that'll give me the, um, the point response function as a function of the Henkel transform variable and the Fourier transform variable. So it looks a little bit complicated, but at the end of the day, I don't need to do these calculations by hand. Um, we're going to do them using a computer. So, um, you know, keeping track of all these transformations turns out to be not so hard.